I've got a problem with the theme music. You got another problem. Well, the theme music, yeah, this stirring, soul wrenching extravaganza, okay, leads the unsuspecting viewer to believe that there's going to be this massive, heroic appearance. Mm-hmm. And then you get us, and it's a sort of a letdown. <laughs> and and don't get me wrong, I mean you've got you've got that sort of Colin Farrell, Alexander the Great thing happening with the hair and yeah. The, oh the yeah, okay, oh, I'm just moving on. You know, hello, I've just captured Babylon. We're popping off to the pub at Persepolis, so we are <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But but right. then it's us, and it doesn't go. Right, I don't so, like this theme music. All right, so you're, th- you're thinking that we're uh, we're letting people down and giving them false expectations of some sort. I absolutely believe that. Okay. And all I right. was thinking, right, maybe, and because we can't use anybody else's music because we got wrapped on the knuckles last time when we <laughs> uh, exited with Pame Yeep no Katerina, yes. something like this, I've brought my own. Can't use someone else's music, make your own. So indulge me, I've got to move back from the microphone, you told me. <laughs> okay, all last right. Last time there was disaster. <laughs> something like this. And then, like, you can jump in and say, and Michael chime in. just gotten this instrument stuck in the <laughs> so that's coming that way and yeah, this is my pride and joy pete yeah so this is uh back home, everybody yeah this this is chinese uh chinese litter this is the arhu and arhu means two because two strings hu and hu is the mongolian tribe because it's a mongolian instrument right okay not chinese now, i'm aware of the fact that and the brilliance of it before we get to that is the bow yeah. Is stuck between the strings. So yes. that you use this side of the bow for that string and that side of the bow, but the bow can't actually leave the strings. No. Which is great. You never lose a bow. Chinese have thought of everything. All right. So now I've, I've, I've got a few questions. One, how did they get the, the bow in between those strings? Oh, that's easy. They actually unscrew it and then screw it back on. That's it. That's The Chinese have thought of everything, guys. <laughs> Trust me. Now... In the Greek community, everyone talks about these Lyras and the Cretans to get together with the Pondians. Because yeah, yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. Lira, I've got Lira. Mm-hmm. You guys conven- uh, conveniently forget the fact that the Constantinopolitans have Lyras as well, but let's not go there. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that the Lira in its various forms can be found all throughout Asia, mm-hmm. okay, right up until China, hence the Chinese uh, violin. Right. Which I learned as a young kid because I was studying Chinese and I was interested in Chinese music because of the salam- similarities it has with Ipirot music. They're both based on the five note pentatonic scale. It's the most ancient form of music you can get. Sometimes right, when you play okay. Chinese music, it mm-hmm. sounds like Ipirotica because of the scale that's used. Wow. But that's another story. What's interesting is the time I played the Chinese leader at the Pondians. Can I tell this story? Oh, please do. Okay, I'm telling the story. <laughs> I like this what story. What happened was this a very, very long time ago, I the guys from Apodimi Compania let me. Uh, play with them at the Bondi Aki Kinotita. They used to have a night there every Friday, and I'd go there. First time I went there, I went there with a Chinese violin. So it'll be interesting. Yep. So I'm trying to play the Mbetika on this thing with uh, various degrees of success. Mm-hmm. This old man comes up to me and says, Tinafto. And I said, yeah. I'm in the Kinesiki Lira. He looks at me and he says, Eh, Milas Polikala Elinika Yaina To which there can only be one response, and that response is Bondios is the key. Shots fired. So I'm thinking one day someone should get together a couple of 
Lirari, this mm. from Crete, Pondos, wherever they are. I mean, they, they yeah. play the Lira in Sicily and in Calabria as well, by the way. And uh, get mm-hmm. together with some Chinese Urhuists. Yes. And see what comes from that jam. Because remember, Beijing is one end of the Silk Road. Right. Trapezunda in Pondos is the other end. Mm. And we forget that. We forget that we're also connected to the Silk Road. Yes. So that's that. And I submit that we must change our theme music to the Khasapo Servico of Karagiozis. Okay. For many reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay. Failing that, Mm -hmm. and because it is an immense strain to listen to that stirring theme music that you've chosen for us. (laughs) And and on the subject of strain, we need to change the name of the show. Another change. I mean, we had this discussion last time. Yeah, yeah, but you didn't take any of it on board. Uh, And the point is this. Romaic ruminations and Daxi, we've ruminated, we've regurgitated. Yeah, yes. fair enough. Greek gropings, piastikanta heriamas, can't yep. do that anymore. No. Hellenic hallucinations, because we're deluded into thinking that what we say makes sense. Or better still, because of the strain involved, Hellenic hemorrhoids. Oh, gee. <laughs> Back to the letter G. <laughs> I hadn't even noticed. <laughs> Just something to take on board okay. during All right. You know meetings, what? Okay? If I'm in the editing studio, I'll I'll think about it. But if you if you don't see any changes anytime soon, you know the reason why. Well, we'll have words. I'm sure we will. We okay. Do. <laughs> so uh, it's been an interesting week this week, okay. and uh, I want to jump straight to it. Uh, and with uh, with screen number one. Ooh. Yeah. Now. Our, uh, we mentioned him last show, but our mutual friend, John Rarak, has posted this on Facebook recently and you reposted it, right? Yeah, and can I say, John, because I came over to your place on Sunday and I didn't get a free meal. You're not getting any plugs again. John from Philolene's Restaurant on Mount Alexander Road, <laughs> Mooney Ponds, best Greek cuisine in Melbourne. You are not getting any more free plugs from me. Ben Oh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, but you, you're still getting them from me, John. Not a problem at all. Hear this, hear this. <laughs> well, you know, I'm banking on it. Yeah, you bank. You yeah. bank. Anyway. Okay. anyway, back to this now. So this is an interesting organisation. I've never heard of this organisation before John posted this up. The European Paratroopers.org. Okay. And I, and I think, I, like I told you a little earlier on, I did some, some research, very can't even call it research, just looked them up pretty much on, on their website and apparently they're based in Slovakia. Well, the first thing that becomes apparent here is Creta Memorial. It should be Cretan Memorial. Okay. Because these people are complete cretans. Complete cretans. Because if you have a look at the fine print, boys and girls, let us pay tribute to our fallen airborne brothers who successfully accompanied the first strategic airborne operation in history. And what they're referring to is 1941, when the uh, Germans landed their paratroopers on Crete. Mm and caused untold misery to the island population. And this year is a particularly sensitive year because Mm. it marks the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Crete. Mm -hmm. This weekend, although the show will probably go to air sometime after that, we're Mm. celebrating here in Melbourne as a community that battle with various parades, uh, the Archbishop's coming down to give a speech Mm -hmm. about the church during the Battle of Crete, Mm. Crete, various other uh, exilosis, Mm. And here are these insensitive morons Mm. doing this and glorifying Mm. the Nazi invasion. Now, the Nazi invasion was a very evil thing. How dare they Mm. sully the memory of the valiant allies and the native population of Crete who Mm. afforded possibly the longest and most strenuous resistance of any other European nation against the Nazis. Everyone else capitulated pretty quickly. Mm. The Cretans wouldn't have any of it. There are photos where Cretans are actually unarmed, jumping Mm. on armed German soldiers and trying to disarm them. That's how courageous they were. That's how committed they were to freedom. And you go and do this and celebrate what? Barbarity, darkness and unmitigated evil? Slovakia, of course, there was Czechoslovakia. Mm. Um, Hitler famously took over the Sudetenland and then bullied the Western powers into yeah. occupying Czechoslovakia. Mm. And the Western powers did so to appease him. It was one of the greatest failures of uh, Western democracies mm. was allowing this guy to do that. Okay, mm. So the Czech Republic was the Czech part of Czechoslovakia. 
was absorbed into the greater German Reich, mm -hmm. and Slovakia became a rump satellite state, ostensibly ruled by a Slovak priest, mm. Father Tizor, I think his name was. Right. Uh, and uh, they were collaborationists. Right. So these were people that were on the evil side during the Second World War. Yeah. And this is just sick. Well, this I is thoroughly it, offensive. I, you know what? I mean, the poster, the poster and their emblem, it almost makes it look like some sort of official uh, military um, event. And, and and I was first thrown off by that, but then I looked at the um, uh, the web the web address, and I said, "Well, I don't see a doc gov anywhere, so it must be some organisation." And uh, sure enough, uh, yeah, it's just a, a small it's, little club that's located in Slovakia. It's ostensibly misleading because you have a look at their banner behind the moustached moron there with the very unfashionable beret, <laughs> and uh, you see the stars. So it looks like it's the European Union. So it looks like Let it's semi official. Up. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And then you have what looks like an airborne tampon coming down in a parachute. <laughs> airborne tampon. Well, that's what it looks like, and I'm sorry. It's it's a terrible, terrible travesty yeah. to commemorate and celebrate unmitigated evil mm. by the people that perpetrated yeah. the Holocaust, by the people that raped and pillaged so many countries, including Greece, Yeah. by the people that stole our gold reserves. Unbelievable. Why would you do this I, 80 years later? I just don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you why. And this is the scary thing about human nature, in my belief, Pete. We forget. Yeah. You know, at the end of the First World War, we said that's the war to end all wars. This yeah. is so bad it can never happen again. Yeah. 30 years later, here we it go, did, round yeah. two. Yeah. Yeah. World War II, we'll never do this again. Yeah. All of a sudden, we've got the nuclear arms race. Yeah. We have this terrible tendency. Yeah, we do. Yeah. We but do. we must never forget. No. And that's why these memorials, these tasteful memorials, uh, they're there more so to remind us not only of the courageous acts that our ancestors or people, um, not, not necessarily our ancestors, but anybody who actually have had to fight off an invasion, you know, um, have uh, you know the sacrifices that they've made, but how lucky we are that we don't that we're not in a position today to be able to actually uh, fight that same fight. If we don't keep on reminding ourselves of that, then Stuff like this. I mean, you start glorifying stuff like this. Well, can I say, what they're glorifying is the technical achievement. The fact that it was planned, they executed it, and it worked. Okay, mm. That's like a group of sharpshooters saying, we glorify that tenant guy over in New Zealand for mm. firing the weapon quickly enough to kill so many innocent people in the mosque in New Zealand. Yeah, that's that's, yeah, very that's apt. exactly what it is. That's a very you apt, cannot uh, celebrate the yeah. technical proficiency of very people apt. that create evil. Yeah. You cannot. You're right. You're you must right. not. You can't. And I would invite these people, these uh, Cretan memorialists, to visit Crete and speak to the local inhabitants and see how they feel after that. Yeah. Yeah? Bit of communication. It's not about big boys with guns and swords and, uh, and mm. parachutes, mm. but actually speak to the people. Learn some stories about what happened there. Villages being burnt, kids being killed. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Bit of that. And better still, if you can't be bothered doing that because you're Cretan morons, Cretan morons, sorry. <laughs> Watch The Guns of Navarone. Great film. Great film, but but all about German depredations. Yeah. Yeah? Mm. I'm getting rolled up now. And I'm no, no, no. It's, and that's, there, there's a reason why I threw it at the beginning, and it's because it was, uh, it was a strong topic of conversation this week within the community. Uh, well, not only in the community, it received a lot of publicity in Greece. Yeah, oh, and the, uh, was that was the other thing. Some there mayor a, of um of of Crete, that's right, one of the towns of Crete, but yeah. more significantly, and this is where I say it's very important not to forget. There's a Greek guy on the committee of these Cretan morons. Yes, I saw that. I saw that today when I was looking up their uh, their board of directors. There was a Greek guy in There's there. There's a Greek guy. Now, how ridiculous is that? I suppose he just used whatever excuse we usually use in the community, and that is, "Ah, oh, was a committee decision. I was outvoted." Is that what you use? <laughs> it's been used a thousand times, even though it probably does have the support of the people who actually claim that they didn't support it. Anyway. Uh, can so you give us an example? I'm not going to go into okay. any examples. Okay, and let's bore move on the, to the next thing. Bore the, uh, You're taking too long, Pete. Come on. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. Uh, moving on, moving on. This is a, this is a great story. Mm. This is a great story. So what we... You so what, what are we looking at here? It's a very interesting 
picture the one you found here because it almost looks like a biblical scene. It does, doesn't it? No, it's almost like Joseph is yeah. doing something in the temple, uh, you know, getting someone to write him a check <laughs> or something like that. But it's not <laughs> yeah, what it's about. But it's not that. No, we're, we're going mes enfants back to ancient Athens, mm-hmm. ancient Athens of the P pre Periclean. I can't say that P pre Periclean. <laughs> number two, number three. Pre-Periclean, got it third time. Got it, got it. Uh, age, to a guy called Aristides, mm. who was a really nice guy by all accounts. Everyone loved him. He was prim, proper, yeah, yeah. poster boy for the Athenians. Mm-hmm. He was the Eddie Maguire of his age before oh, man. the race. You're going so towards. well with your analogies, and now you just totally threw it down the tube. Well, he was up until this, this problem that he had uh, recently. He was the man. Yeah, it was the poster boy right. for everything that Australian manhood should represent. What we're looking at, what years are we looking at? Is it the 5th century? Eddie Maguire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, Aristide here. I don't know, Aristide, if you're honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, Aristide this year. Yeah. yeah. Persian Wars. So, before Pericles, as we said, I'm not saying pre, yet, but before him, mm-hmm. around about the time of Themistocles. Right, around that yeah. era, yep. So, a very just man, very prim, very proper man. Mm-hmm. A very patriotic man. Mm-hmm. And the ancient Athenians, even before Big Brother boys and girls, invented the idea of voting people off the show. So the way that you dealt with internal dissent in Athens, instead mm. of allowing things to fester and everyone becoming all passive-aggressive, not talking to each other the way you would in a Greek silo, yeah. okay, what they do is every so often they'd have a vote. they say, okay, who don't we like? Mm-hmm. It's like a popularity con- contest in reverse. Yeah. Write their name down on a piece of pot because mm-hmm. paper was not invented yet. Mm-hmm. Okay. There were plenty of broken pots around. Write the name on a piece of pot. Whoever gets them the most names gets voted out of Athens for 10 years. That's called ostracism. That's where we get the word ostracized from. Right. Ostrakon is a piece of broken pot. Right. Exostrakismos is this process of ostracism. Okay, I did not know that. So one. they were going through this process and uh, a peasant. Enter the peasant there wearing... Why is he wearing a headcloth? I think the artist was confused. But anyway, <laughs> peasant in the red, and he wouldn't have been wearing red because red would have been a very expensive colour right. to have in ancient times because mm-hmm. the way they used to get it was from the Murex shellfish in Phoenicia. Mm-hmm. And you needed tons of these to do anything, which was why red was the colour of royalty. So whoever did this picture, all wrong. Beside the point. Mm-hmm. Peasant comes up to Aristides and says, can you help me write a name? Mm. And Aristides, being prim and proper and always willing to help, you know, the first Boy Scout in history, mm. says, yes, of course, my good man. Why are you wearing a weird cloth? Are you an Israelite from the Bible? <laughs> Having heard the answer, no, said, what name would you like me to write? Says, Aristides. Right. And Aristides gets taken aback. And he says to him, why do you want to write that name down on there? Mm. And he says, because everyone calls him the just, because his name was Aristides or Vikios, mm. Aristides the just. And I'm just sick of hearing about this goody-goody two-shoes that everyone's going on about. They're so just, <laughs> and just this and just that. And bugger him, I don't want to hear about it anymore. Right. Now, Aristides could have done what I would have done, yeah. which is written his own name down. <laughs> he could have written an enemy's name down yeah. that he didn't like. Mm. Uh, it is said that he didn't like Themistocles at one stage because they were fighting over the same young boy. Because they did do these kind of things in ancient Athens. Mm -hmm. They did. That was just, we accept that that's what they did. But he didn't do that. Instead, he faithfully wrote down the name of himself. Great story, man. I love that story. Yeah, he was exiled for his troubles. Yeah. So exile means 10 years outside of Athens, Mm -hmm. but you can live anywhere. And he chose to live in one of the Athenian colonies in Thrace, Mm -hmm. a lot of them. So it was Athens away from Athens. It's like getting exiled from Greece and coming to Melbourne. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. Okay. And while he was in uh, these colonies, instead of being mm. bitter about Athens, yeah, and we've seen many Athenian Turk goats in history, like Alkiviadis, who yeah. then leaves and goes to the Spartan side and leads mm. you know, all sorts of conflict and problems, he encourages all the colonists to send soldiers to Athens mm. to defend Athens against the Persians. What a yeah. great guy. What Amazing. an utter twerp. <laughs> Twerp. He could have exiled, but <laughs> oh, the vagaries of history. Had he tried to exile Themistocles, had Themistocles been exiled, mm-hmm. we wouldn't have had the Battle of Salamis. We wouldn't have had thousands of schoolboys confusing the Battle of Salamis with the Battle of Salami. <laughs> his con is good. <laughs> None of this would have happened. I just love, I just love the fact that the guy turned around and is okay, not a problem at all, and he actually wrote the 
the right name down. I know. It's ridiculous. And the great thing is archaeological discoveries yeah. support this point of view because they've dug a number of these ostraka mm. and they found the names of Pericles. He came along the scene later. Yeah. Themistocles, mm. Miltiades, Kimon, his son, and Aristides. Amazing stuff. Amazing. But somehow none of Saki's sort of us. Not yet. Mm. Not yet. But, uh, you know, there, I think there's, there might be more than one broken... Yeah. <laughs> one broken pot with his name on it, I think, just hasn't been discovered yet. And you know that they also invented certain other things. For example, they would set the Ostraka alight, and that would be known as smoking pot. <laughs> too far? Too much? <laughs> yeah, I'll pull back. Okay. I'll pull back. Yeah, now, no, I know. That's my bad next even qu- for me. <laughs> my next question Ooh. is this: What were you? Uh, what were you smoking when um, you claimed that this guy's Greek, Mister Tony Bennett? I'm hurt. Well. Loves, you know, Our great, legendary great singing. crooner, guys. Legendary crooner, Tony Bennett. <laughs> I hate crooning. I find it boring. I hate that kind of elevator music. Right. It's not my thing. Not your thing. I like the theme to Karagiozzi. Yes. Tony Bennett has Greco origins. Right. Now, you have to explain Greco? that because everyone's saying he's Italian, right? He's yeah. from Italy, isn't he? Italians would say that. Italians think everyone's Italian. No one's Italian. Everybody <laughs> Greek. Everyone's Greek. But the point is this. Southern Italy, since ancient times, mm-hmm. was colonised by Greek tribes. One of the things you did, if there was, and Greece was a poor country, and it yeah. always has been. Mm-hmm. Soil can't support a large population. Population gets too large. Mm. Civil unrest. Off you go. Go and found a colony. Yeah. All of Calabria, Puglia, and Sicily, mm-hmm. most of Sicily, mm-hmm. was colonised by ancient Greek tribes. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. So... Both Ionic and Dorian. Mm -hmm. And Calabria especially, full. And uh, the Greek or people are descendants of the Greek inhabitants of Cato Italia, which they used to call Megali Elava, Magna Grecia, Mm. Big Greece. Mm. And even today, there are villages... In Calabria, the Greek language has mostly died out. There's only a few very small villages where it remains. In mm. Apulia, there are a few more, and in Sicily, it's gone altogether. Mm. But right up until Mussolini's time, Mussolini did a lot of work to try and eradicate the Greek language from Italy. Really? A lot of work, because it was all part of that unification, everyone, one people, one race, oh, that one was, civilization. Yeah, was, that's right, you're right, that was a big thing back yeah. then, back and in also the day. The yeah. fa- also, because um, there was urbanization, people were migrating to the big cities, mm-hmm. they weren't isolated anymore, the young people stopped learning and speaking the language. Mm-hmm. It's known as the Greco language. It's a form of Peloponnesian because we know that during Byzantine times and even during the Ottoman times, people from Albania, Epirus, Peloponnese, mm-hmm. especially Mani, these areas, would go and settle in these places. So the ancient population was constantly being replenished mm-hmm. by new arrivals. And they've got their own dialect. It's infused with Italian grammatical forms. It's infused with mm-hmm. Italian pronunciation. Mm. It's written in the Roman letters. Right. But it is identifiably Greek. And one of the most uh, famous and populous villages where they still speak Greco or Grecanica mm-hmm. is a village called Calimera. It's actually called... It's called Calimera. Calimera, okay. Yeah. And the Greek government has sent teachers there to teach them and there's this discussion about whether they should teach them their own Greek or dialect or proper Greek. Okay. No one's sure. Mm-hmm. Some, some of the students uh, are very proud of their Greek origins and they learn the modern Greek. Others mm-hmm. say, well, look... Where Greek, or that's a culturally distinct thing from the modern Greek, therefore yep. we prefer to do that. So they've got to figure that out on their own. Now, Tony Bennett yeah. comes from the village of Podargoni. Well, his dad did. He migrated to America from Podargoni. Yeah. Podargoni is a Greek village where they spoke Greek up until the start of the 20th century. They don't anymore. Podargoni comes from the Greek uh, Podagiros, mm-hmm. which means fast. Okay. Okay. So, yes, he is of Greco origin, like many, many other people. Wow. Has he ever um, uh, discussed it at all? Or oh, no, he says that he comes from that village and that the people there are Greco. Mm-hmm. They identify as Greco. They don't speak the language anymore. It's kind of like a lot of Greek Australians. Yeah. Um, they may not speak the Greek language. Yeah. But they identify as Greek. Now, the Italians, the way they say the word Greek is Greco. Mm-hmm. Uh, Greek Australians identify as Greek, <laughs> and it's the same thing. It shows you that 
the definition of Greek is fluid, mm -hmm. that it exhausts superlatives, it mm -hmm. transcends definition, mm -hmm. it has its own organic dynamism of its own, mm. and it can even produce crooners like Tony Bennett. Speaking of, uh, you just mentioned uh, Greeks, uh, Greeks, you know, Greek Australians uh, identifying as Greek but not actually speaking uh, the language. And uh, that's a constant uh, debate in in, uh, in our community, whether it's something that we should maintain, should not maintain. Everyone does say that we've got to maintain the language uh, and that's an important uh, part of our identity. And I think this is a topic that we're going to be revisiting a few times. Uh, but um, it clearly it is a battle uh, that we're losing here. Like There are less and less people uh, that are speaking uh, the Greek language. And there's another post you put up on Facebook uh, this week, and it was some numbers that were basically coming through. I've got it up on screen here. Let me just bring that back up here. So uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming these numbers come from the, the ABS, census, yeah. yeah, the census, right? Uh, and you can see there's been a, a dip into, in, as to the number of people claiming that Greek is their second language spoken uh, at home. Because the other thing we also discussed uh, before this uh, show is how you can only list one other language on the census, right? So, you know, if in other words, if households are speaking Italian and Greek, it will probably uh, it's only room to actually put down one language, not not both. So, couldn't the, these numbers be skewed in a very you know, negative way to show that you know certain languages are even though certain languages aren't being spoken, even though they probably are. Well, there was a big discussion on this post and another people pointed out, oh, I always get people to, even if they don't speak Greek at home, mm. put down that you do because it's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm probably one of those people. So, oh. Yeah, well, you're I, I probably am. And uh, that's great that you could say this. <laughs> um, you're one of those people that are allowing us to boost our numbers artificially and hence our ego and our pride. Uh, and, yeah, that's, that's uh, me. That's a very important thing to do. But <laughs> So figures obviously are given to oodles of interpretation. Yeah. People can twist them. People can answer incorrectly. Mm -hmm. A lot of people refuse to, to uh, put in the census for whatever reason they speak Greek when they do. Yes. Other people, for patriotic reasons or for whatever other reasons, will say that they do when they don't. Yes. Yes. It's what happens. But generally, there is a consensus that the language is declining. Yes. And then again, the other question is this. If it's a self-assessment, what are the criteria that gauge how you speak language? To what extent can you be said to speak a language without measuring the proficiency in that language? Good question. Okay, if it's mm. like, e Does that mean you're speaking Greek? <laughs> I don't know the answer to these questions. Right. What I can say is that it's definitely true that the Greek language among the second, third, fourth generation is declining. Yes. And the way I measure that and I notice that is this. First of all, even among the second generation, which is mm. us, mm -hmm. because our parents were either born overseas or came here when they were young or born here or whatever, but we're generally considered the second generation, you and I. Yes. Most people of the first generation who, mm. speak, who know Greek speak Greek to each other. Yes. Okay. Mm. People of the second generation tend, when they do speak Greek, to use it as a language to communicate with their parents. Yes. Very rarely do two mm. Greek Australian people born here of the same generation You're use right. it to speak to each other. You're right. There's a social context. Yes. And the social context is if you speak Greek to a person of your own generation and you're mm -hmm. not from the first generation, mm. that is considered weird. It's not done. It's just a social convention. Yeah, okay. I can then agree with that, yeah. Another social convention is this. People of a grandparent's age to children who are of their grandchildren's age. The social convention there is do not speak to those children in Greek. I don't understand. So in other words, okay. my grandparents will not speak to so your, your children in, yeah, in, in the, Greek. There's an automatic assumption that they by now only speak English. So even if I you, see. So even if those I kids see. do speak Greek, yeah. they get spoken to in English. Okay. And, yeah, that confuses, and that confuses the rats out of them. Yeah. So there are these unwritten, unspoken conventions within our barikia about mm. where and in what context the language mm. is spoken. Of course, language is always about context. You know, There are places and spaces mm. where you'll speak the Greek language. There are places and spaces where you won't, for whatever reason. Mm. We are conversing to each other in English. There's a reason for that. There's mm -hmm. a social context behind that. Yeah. 
So is the language declining? Yes, it is. Why is the language declining? It doesn't have to decline. Of all the nationalities in this country, we have the most schools. We've spent the most money to build those schools. Okay? So basically what we're looking at is a failure of our institutions. Mm. Because what are we actually teaching? In the beginning, it was all about creating an identity, perpetuating the language. Then it was all about making money out of it yeah. and making Greek uh, language acquisition fun and easy. Okay? Yeah. And I remember Greek teachers yeah. telling us, well, you know, we work for certain providers and they tell us don't mark home, uh, homework incorrect or don't set homework because that makes the kids sad and we want them to want to come to Greek school. It's almost like an entertainment thing. When did that happen? That didn't happen during my time. No, this was after our generation. Yeah, because yeah. I'm telling you now. And, <laughs> and you have some amazing schools, like the uh, Greek Orthodox Community of Melbourne School in the city on the Saturday. It's an amazing school. You've always mentioned that school. It's an amazing school. You send your kids there, right? I do. And yeah. uh, they're not going to give me, just so that everyone knows, they're not going to give me free tuition as a result. <laughs> I asked them, they politely declined. I didn't press the matter further. Fair enough. But... Amazing teachers from Greece yes. who understand the Australian context, really committed to teaching the kids, making it a worthwhile experience. Unbelievable. And there are some schools where it's a complete waste of time. Yeah. Well, how do you mention that then? And there are some parents who render the whole exercise a complete waste of time. When I was teaching at a particular Greek school, I remember kids being left at the door and their parents saying, oh, you know, be careful that the teacher doesn't hit you. And, oh, be careful because okay. it's going to be so boring. All right. And I have to say to one parent, why the hell are you bringing this kid here yeah. if you're doing that to them yeah, and you're point. prejudicing them from yeah. the beginning? Now, that may be your experience, mm. but we don't hit anybody here. Mm. And they're actually getting something out of it. So why are you doing this? And the answer is that they've got their own psychological hang-ups and issues, mm. which mm. I believe stem towards feelings towards parents. All right, so I, I'm, uh, yeah, there's so much to break down here, um, but I'm going to start asking a few questions. One, uh, you've said you made you made a particular claim with regards to the school that you send uh, the kids, uh, your kids to, and being, being the Greek Orthodox community of Melbourne and Victoria, and the schools that they run there, and the and the teachers that are from Greece and understand the Australian context and teach it in a certain way. Clearly, this is a curriculum that was uh, what brought by them from Greece? No, uh, they was developed it? it here. It's an organic curriculum based on a Greek... Who community. developed it? Th they did. These people that the Greek Orthodox community brought yeah, from Greece? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they, they didn't bring them specifically from Greece. These are people that have migrated during yeah. the crisis. They are t qualified teachers from Greece. Yes. They've developed or adapted the curriculum from Greece to suit the Australian environment. Right. And it works. This is not a curriculum that's adopted... Victoria or even Australia-wide, I would imagine. Well, this is another point. When we talk about aspirations and, uh, I, I hate to use this word, KPIs. <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong with a good KPI. Oh, there absolutely is something <laughs> wrong with a KPI. You know what KPIs can do. They can go and KPI themselves. But <laughs> okay. what do we want out of Greek language education? Every school mm -hmm. does its own thing. It does, there yeah. There is no consensus mm. what we want to do. There is no common syllabus. There is no common aim. Mm. It's an unregulated within the Barikia industry where everyone just do, does whatever they want. I'm just supposed to do it to fit with what VCE, modern Greek, is well, supposed to Well, in year 11 and 12, that's what you do because you have to because at that stage, yes. you know, the people that make it that far, which yeah. is increasingly less, yes. the enrolments in that are falling drastically. Yes. Okay. Agreed. But everywhere yeah. else, no. Right. Uh, so... Uh, who defines that at VC level? Is it just the education department and the Greeks that work for the education department? This is VCE well, it's Greek, the same right? With each language, there needs to be criteria. Right, they do all that. They do all that. Okay, all right. So, what is the criteria for success, in your opinion? Uh, what makes uh, what makes how it's taught at the GIM CV? Uh, GOC MV, yes, GO, the GOC MV. What actually? GOC MV, I like. <laughs> I think we're going to adopt this. <laughs> the GOC MV. What actually makes? What specifically um, did you see um, method-wise that they do that's different to everybody else that that works? 
because it's very hard for me to imagine what you mean by contextualizing it for the Australian uh, well, discourse. I'll well, put it this way. If you are going to speak a language, that's the measure of its success. If you feel comfortable in using that language in the mm-hmm. social context, mm-hmm. that is the measure of its success. And that's you see that happening at being spoken. You see that happening yeah. at the uh, when Cock you MB speak schools. a language. That is the measure of how that language will be spoken and what will happen with it. If you're not speaking the language and if you're merely learning the language because mum and dad want to go shopping on a Saturday mm. and they need to leave you somewhere, yeah, or because you've stayed over with your yam papu because if your yam papu don't take you to Greek school, no one else will. Mm-hmm. That is not the success. That is koro de bomaste. Okay, mm-hmm. it is speaking the language, finding a use for it. That's the context. Right now, we're losing the battle for context because even though we have organised institutions, even though we have a lot of functions, most of those functions are functions that exclude children or which don't find a place for children. True. Okay, and when they do, they're usually up on the stage dancing. That's right. And there's no communication. Well, There needs to be a facilitation for children to be able to communicate with the rest of community in Greek. Well, yeah. And remember, that's not an easy thing because we're being brought up in an Anglo-Saxon monocultural country Yes, where mm. the monoglot culture mm. pervades everything. Anglo-Saxons do not allow the pervasion of other tongues. They don't learn other tongues easily like other Europeans do. Mm. So we're living within that culture trying yes. to keep our own language alive, and that is very difficult. It is. Uh, admittedly... Uh uh, I get I get the distinct impression that you were probably very good at Greek at school. I was completely abysmal at it, uh, and uh, I had major major issues in speaking it. Spoke English at home to, to both my, my both parents. Mum was born here, Dad was born overseas, but he spoke to my mother in English. And um, and I can tell you that it wasn't until I got involved within the Greek community, like getting on. The, to these committees and so forth where I realised I really had to up my game with regards to Greek. And it didn't actually happen by me going home and reading a whole lot, but just immersing myself within the community and all the Greek that's basically spoken. And you had no choice. If you wanted to convey something, you wanted to push an, a, an agenda, a, a thought, you, you had to... The, the better you could communicate in Greek, um, the better chance you had of being able to uh, get what you wanted across the line. So there's your context right there. You found a context which is the opposite of the cretinous parachutists. You know, the parachute is <laughs> drops down. Mm. You're buoyed in terms of your, your Hellenism by all the hot air generated in these internally <laughs> boring community <laughs> meetings <laughs> where you're talking, talking, talking and producing absolutely nothing. Well done. Oh, yes, of course. I would not recommend that. Well, I would not recommend that as a way of actually trying to uh, uh, garner the. Um, enough energy to learn the language. There must be a better ways of doing that than actually being berated by people 30 or 40 years older than you uh, because of, or even worse, patronised. Patronised, really? You were patronised? Well... Can you name some names? No, I, I definitely won't be doing that on this show. Well, it's a family show. <laughs> I'm sure they're not watching. <laughs> not doing that at all. Okay. All right. Uh, you know what? I can, we could discuss this further, but I'm going to lighten the mood a bit here. Because, again, going back to one of your posts, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this very grainy f- picture here. Roy Orbison. <laughs> <laughs> Orbisonopolis? No, Roy Orbison. Roy Orbison? Okay. Actually not. No, no. So uh, who is he? Who, who, who is know. this guy? Yeah. My, 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 many people don't know. Have you seen the Shawshank Redemption? I have. And you remember that horrible warden? What was his name? Samuel Norton. You know what? I've got a picture of him here. you got a picture of him? Because, uh, there, there, he is, is. there he is. <laughs> That's the bit where he's, he starts talking to Raquel Welsh and uh, asking her where uh, Andy Dufresne has That's gone. right. Pulls the yeah. poster off. And yeah, then, uh, spoiler also, alert. C- sees it there. Th- there he is. Now, yeah. flick back to the previous one. It's the same, same guy. Same guy, man. Okay. So, so this, this is a warden, right? So this is warden Samuel Norton. <laughs> and what many people don't know is that in the film... Uh, Warden Norton commits suicide because of the fin- financial uh, bad things that he's done that yeah. Andy Dufresne's been doing for him, yeah. ra- laundering money and doing all mm-hmm. these things. Okay, and he kills himself. Yes. But that's not what really happened. That was just for the movie. What he did was he faked his suicide and he fled to Thessaloniki 
There he assumed the identity of one Dimitrios Vakinotis. Okay. Okay. Who worked for Nescafe <laughs> in Thessaloniki. <laughs> oh, this is true. You can look this up. Dimitris uh, Vakinotis worked for Nescafe. And at the International Ecstasy of Thessaloniki in 1957, yes. he was looking to make himself a nice cup of Nescafe. Mm-hmm. Couldn't get any hot water because it's grease and nothing works. Okay. <laughs> and invented the frappe. So that part so of the story is true, Norton right? <laughs> Samuel Norton. I mean, they look as if they've been separated at that's birth. Every, now, now okay. Again. Yeah, that, is, look. that is Dimitris Vakinotis, and that yeah. is Dimitris Vakinotis. Yeah, that, one, that one is. Yeah, this one is. Okay, and the other guy is the warden Samuel Norton. Yeah, uh, okay. listen, it's a, I don't know how you came up with the thing, but this the, the frappe story is a great one. And I like it. And he invented the frappe, and yeah. thousands of Greek Australians mm. okay, partake of the frappe, Yes. As an integral gesture affirming their culture. Yes, this is you true. You go to Oakley yeah. and have a frappe. Yeah. I hate the frappe. You don't like you don't have a frappe? I can't stand the frappe. I will not have the frappe. I'm old school. I want my Greek coffee. Your Greek coffee. Greek coffee. Mm. And I want to have it quickly. Oh. And then I want to move on with my life. Oh, I want to sit there you're over missing the out, man. Glass. Oh, you're missing out. The frappe pontification the which is involved with drinking this horrible thing. Oh, I don't know if we can continue the show anymore after after that revelation. And you go to Oakley and they actually sell the frappe d'ochtipitiri, which is a machine that's been invented yes. to agitate the frappe. And I love the <laughs> idea of agitating the frappe, <laughs> really pissing the frappe off, <laughs> making it irate so that making the frappe does the nasty mouth. things to you. <laughs> you just stole my punchline. I'm sorry. Try not to do it again. This time I'll forgive you. <laughs> right. You know, it might actually happen more often... Uh, Purely by accident because of how many of these nah, shows we're doing. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> nah. So, inventor of the frappe, our, we doff our feathers to you, Reverend Samuel Morton, Warden Samuel Morton, and uh, may I, actually, no, no, it was Andy Dufresne while he was in Shawshank Prison who had nothing to do, couldn't find the uh, hot water, invented the frappe. Samuel Norton took that with him to Saloniki under the shoe name. Right. You know, all that other stuff is just a cover story. Okay, fair enough. Well, you know, I but, think but, I think there's a is, book in that. He is. Vakinotis is the real inventor of the frappe. Yeah, great story. Great story. Right. Parga. Ever been to Parga? I haven't been to Parga, but... Um, you look like just the kind of guy who wouldn't go to Parga. <laughs> no, I haven't been to Parga, but... I tell you what I found fascinating with this post that you put up. The the ability for countries, empires, to take and sell cities. It's just something that that I don't think we sort of uh, uh, we don't discuss. It's not something that that I've read happening many times, and yet I'm not surprised that it has. So. Uh, Barga, where where is that exactly? Barga is in Ipiros. Okay. It's on the coast. It's a beautiful coastal town. It's a tourist town. Yeah. Uh, rocky cliffs and then the sea. Okay. Which means it's been ruined by tourism. They've built all these horrible hotels and it just looks disgusting now because Greeks have no sense of aesthetic. <laughs> oh, when it comes, come on. When it comes to the natural environment and its preservation, no, they absolutely do not. And they've proven that time and time again through the development of some the tourist great islands. buildings in some in built in in, in some uh, uh, some of these uh, cliff faces and so forth. They look absolutely gorgeous. And Which ones? Oh, I know. So I haven't got it. No, okay, can't fine. Point to fine. Examples that never All happen. right, that's it. That's my that's my task next. Now, I'm going to have to actually start looking some of that Barga, stuff up. Apart from being a tourist town, mm. was a very important place because it was a port. Nicholas yeah. is mountainous, mm-hmm. so it's the gateway for the interior to the exterior, and obviously on the other side of the sea is Italy. Mm -hmm. So it's a gateway to Europe. Mm -hmm. Barga, during Ottoman times, Mm -hmm. and a lot of areas along the Illyrian and Epirot and uh, Peloponnesian coastline were ruled intermittently by the Venetians. Mm -hmm. When the Venetian Empire fell thanks to Napoleon, Okay, yeah, who Maniots believe was... uh, Greek and came from money because I've heard of this. Corsica. Yeah, you would have heard the story. We should uh, talk I'd, about that one day. Well, we will. Um, we will. It should be called the delusion of the Maniots. Oh, gee. Do you know what Colocotroni <laughs> said about the Maniots? Uh, yeah, that was another post of yours. Colocotroni said, I maniates lismonun tapanda diatagrosia. They forget everything for money. Well, isn't that a good thing for if you're a Maniot? 
I don't know. The way I read it, you can read it two ways. One is that it's just money hungry, or the other thing is give me some money and I'll forget <laughs> I saw that. You know, give me some money and I'll forget I saw this show. Some money. I love I love the pun. So, but no. Napoleon takes over part of right, the yeah. Venetians and it's held for a few years and then obviously Napoleon loses after the invasion of uh, Russia and all these other things. It's yeah. the French Empire. The mm-hmm. British move in for the kill and they take most of the empire the French Empire, mm-hmm. back. So, mm. but a few other areas, the Ionian Islands, right, uh, taken over by the British. Yeah. So the British hold on to Parga, and the British obviously in communication with the Ottomans, and they have a good relationship with the Ottomans. Yeah. They need to. That's the gateway to the east. Mm-hmm. And they decide in 1819, you know what? Parga is an asset. We own Parga. We're going to sell it to Ali Pasha. And Ali Pasha is the bloodthirsty tyrant of Yanina. He's an Albanian from Tepeleni. He's the guy that the Suryotes didn't like. He's also an interesting guy because all of the major captains of the revolution, or not all, but most, yeah. were trained in his court. And he eventually tried to create an independent kingdom and the Sultan ordered his death and he was killed. Right, but I did not know that. It is arguable that if Ali Pasha's did not have this independent streak, mm-hmm then they would not have received the military tra- training and the connections that they required in order to create this new country called Greece. So again, how wow. how history has a flow-on effect. Wow, man. I, I've, I had the, no idea that they the, were actually trained there. The official language of the court was Greek. So that was the first time since Byzantium that an official language, not an informal language, an official language mm-hmm. of the state was Greek. Yep. Okay, Ali Pasha's court. But... The I've lost my train of thought boarding at the station. <laughs> what are we talking about? We're talking about Ali Parga. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He even commissioned epics in Greek. For example, his fight for the Suliotes, because the Suliotes were just recalcitrant. And let's let's exhaust some myths about the Suliotes mes enfants. Suliotes were fearsome warriors, but also Suliotes were a pain in the ass because Suliotes people would go to all the other villages and they didn't care whether you're Greek, right. Muslim, whatever, and just say, Give us money. I want money. Suliotes. Yes. Because that's they didn't grow things. They survived on exporting their military skills and plunder. So they had all these other villagers paying them tribute. And if you didn't pay them tribute, they'll do bad things to you. Like a protection racket of sorts. Well, that's what it was. Suli was an organized protection racket. <laughs> and <laughs> how long did this go on for? Ages. But then Ali Pasai got sick of them. Okay? Right. And there were various wars and they had to leave. And that's been... S- written within to the Greek narrative of the revolution because they were independent, the Suliotes. They didn't want to be under anyone. They just wanted to do their own thing. Yeah. When he defeated the Suliotes, he commissioned a Albanian guy called Haji Shekreti mm-hmm. to write the Ali Pashiad, like the Iliad, modelled on the Iliad, the Ali Pashiad. Wow. In Greek, in the colloquial Greek spoken in Epirus at that time, mm. an epic poem of vast amount of verses mm. extolling Ali Pasa. That would be done on purpose for his propaganda reasons, yeah, so no and doubt, for his right? own reading yeah. pleasure, because there's mm. nothing better than curling up in bed with a good book, which is I'm, all about how great you are. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty I sure I've written to do with some it. really interesting books about how great my hairstyle is in my time, <laughs> and I enjoy them thoroughly and utterly. So while that's all going on, right, Parga, yes, Parga. Apart from the people that live in Parga, all these refugees that are leaving Ipiros because of the wars between Ali Pasa and everyone. Because Ali Pasa was the Saddam Hussein of his time. You just look in the wrong direction, he gets offended, tries to kill you. All these people living in Parga at the time when the British say, OK, Ali Pasa, how much do you want for Parga? Uh, two football cards and an Xbox, no worries. Here's Parga. They all decide to leave. All right. So this painting shows that. 1819, the embarkation of the Greeks of Parga. They all went to Kerkira. And the reason why they went was they didn't want to stay in beyond Ali Pasa. They disinterred the bones of their ancestors to take them Gee, with them. Man. It was to that level. Yeah. Eventually, some of them came back after Ali Pasa was killed, but not all of them. A lot of them stayed in the Ionian Islands. They went elsewhere. So, right. yeah, you asked me the question, how can you sell a city? But you remember after the First World War, they were apportioning out colonies. Yes. Um, the top part of New Guinea was German, and then the British got that, and Australia ended up administering it. Yeah, there were but selling it, I don't know. I don't Ta- know. Tanzania 
was a German colony and they took over that. So no, they, they can swap and play around with colonies all the time because th- this is just child's yeah, play with these people. selling They those. are commodities. Yeah. And people like commodities yeah. for imperialists. Yeah. We don't like imperialists on this show. <laughs> is that just one of the rules we've got now? <laughs> Well, I, I refuse to have any imperialists on the show. Right, okay. I'll keep that in mind before they, we actually organise no, our no, first no, guest. Because, you know, you have that, um, what do you call it, the, the waiting list, and I've struck all the imperialists off it. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, it's a huge waiting list. That's absolutely no, huge. Prince Philip wanted to go on the show, and we were told him no. He didn't recover from that. <laughs> <laughs> Too much? I don't think so. <laughs> That was a good one. I like that. I like that. Now, speaking of, I don't know, imperialism, there's a, there, there is a uh, a specific, well, there is a certain date um, this week. Um, was it? Is it today? Is it tomorrow? When uh, you posted something on the sack of Constantinople. Okay, you'll have to be specific. There was the sack race of Constantinople. <laughs> And then there were two major sacks of the city. Okay. Right. We always focus on the 29th of May, 1453. Yes. Which was the day of mourning. It was when the Sultan yes. took over the city and Byzantium was destroyed. And that was the last time there was a Greek-speaking independent state, mm. apart from Principality of Pondus and Muria, which lasted for a little bit of time, mm-hmm. and Crimea, which was the last one, the Greeks of the Crimea. Right. But apart from that, the, the empire, everything vanished. Mm. What we don't know was that there was a previous sack in yeah. 1204, which yeah. arguably was an even worse sack. It's the Fourth Crusade that came the through. The Fourth right? Crusade. Yeah. And yeah. what we're looking here mm. is, uh, I think that's Delacroix's painting of the entry of the Fourth Crusaders into Constantinople. Yeah, it's a great painting. Which was a terrible, 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 terrible thing, yeah. which we will never forgive the West for because they're evil imperialist scum. Because you have the West, you have the East. Uh, we are our own version of, if you like, European civilization. Yeah. Based on Greco Roman civilization with mm. an infusion of Christianity. We developed something very vibrant, mm. very original, and mm. very unique. Yeah. If it was not for this civilization, the ancient texts which form the basis of Western civilization would not have survived. Correct. The Renaissance yes. would have happened. Yep, you're okay. right. Yeah. Theology wouldn't have been developed to the extent that it was. Yeah. A culture of learning, the first ever university mm. was not in the West, it was in Constantinople. Yeah. It was called Pandidactirion which means university, Hmm. okay? Very vibrant empire. Mm -hmm. And then what you get when you have this very vibrant, very strong empire Mm -hmm. is that you have the West, Western powers, trying Mm -hmm. to appropriate that. Yeah. This empire had a Roman identity because it was a continuation, it was the Eastern continuation of the Roman Empire. Yes. People spoke Greek, Mm. but they felt that they were Roman because Mm. they were part of that legacy. Mm. Then you had the Westerners who also said, no, we are the Romans. This yes. is the Germanic kingdom, Charlemagne. And yeah, 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 that's right. And yeah. then you had a schism between the churches over doctrine and over the Pope's right. Mm. 1053 or? 1054, I think Four. it was. Okay, okay. 1056. I'm <laughs> doing well, doing well. Over the Pope's primacy and a few other points yeah, of uh, that's right, yeah. the, the, the creed and all these other things which mm. we won't trouble... The, uh, the viewer with yeah. because they're actually quite boring <laughs> but what it does is it creates this situation where for the first time East and West are not communicating Yes, you have a West which is always trying to belittle the East mm-hmm. the, the Easterners are effeminate you can't trust them mm-hmm. they're crafty, they're greedy mm-hmm. and all the stereotypes which have ever since been applied, what we call Orientalism yeah, the West belittling the East in order to dominate it come from that era Right. Edward Said, who was a famous uh, Palestinian philosopher, wrote about colonialism and Orientalism. He wrote mm. the essay Orientalism about the West and how they tried to diminish the East in order to colonize and dominate it. And he left out Byzantium altogether. It's the major flaw in his analysis because that are, they are the roots. We even see it with the Romans trying to present the Greeks as effeminate in ancient times, but really this becomes a thing during Byzantium. Right. In 1204, mm-hmm. there was the Fourth Crusade. Mm-hmm. How did the Crusades begin? That's another thing where we see that the West dominates the discourse. Mm-hmm. The Crusaders were the knights from the, went to the Holy Land yeah. to uh, rid the uh, Holy That's Land right. from the evil Muslims. Mm. And then you have the revisionist historians of the modern age saying, well, you know, actually the Muslims weren't that bad yeah. and the Crusaders were invaders and how <laughs> dare they come there. And what no one gets is that the Crusades were a reaction 
to the Emperor Alexios Komnenos, yes. who took over Byzantium at a time when there was great infiltration of tribes coming in from the um, Turkish tribes coming in from the east. Yeah. And he appealed to Christendom saying, brothers, help, mm. otherwise we can't hold on. Yeah. And the Pope issued a call for people to help. Yeah. And the whole idea was come and help us in Asia Minor mm -hmm. and then do whatever you want after that. The Westerners did assist in taking over the city of Nikia, Iznik, and various other parts in the interior of Asia Minor, mm -hmm. which is what they were requesting there. They, mm. they decided to go to the Holy Land and take over Jerusalem, do whatever else they did. Yeah. And they created Crusader kingdoms, mm -hmm. and then they turned on the Byzantine Empire. Yeah. And they had this love-hate relationship. Give us money, help us, do this, but also, you know, with these parts of the empire which we've taken for ourselves, and we're not giving them back because yeah. we've got to have something for our pains. Mm -hmm. And they were up against a more sophisticated civilization, being the Arabs mm -hmm. and the Byzantines as well. They come into Constantinople and there are contemporary accounts. Mm. They are amazed at what they see. They yeah. haven't seen so much gold before. Yeah. They haven't seen so much sophistication. Yeah. They haven't seen women being afforded such a prominent place. Mm -hmm. And they are at the same time shocked and awed by what they see and then also insanely jealous and resentful. Yeah. So Alexios is hosting all these people thinking that they're going to be grateful and whatever. Mm. What they're actually doing is making inventories in their mind. What can we plunder when we can? Yeah. In the Fourth Crusade, they got their opportunity. As usual, Greek people were fighting over who was going to be emperor. Mm -hmm. You know, we fight here in Australia in our clubs about who's going to be president. Yeah. Over there was who was going to be emperor. There was a family squabble. And each part of the family was asking Western uh, factions to support them. Mm -hmm. And indebted and getting themselves in debt in the process. Mm. During the Fourth Crusade, the uh, the Pope calls the Crusade. The Crusaders say, yeah, we're going off to fight. And they say to the Venetians, can we have some transportation, please? And the wily Venetians say, yeah, we'll give you uh, transportation. Can you pay for it? Uh, money? Sorry, forgot about that. I said, don't worry, don't worry. Um, we want to attack this Croatian city called Zara. So if you help us take over Zara, not the clothing shop... <laughs> <laughs> which provides poorly stitched garments made in sweatshops somewhere, I believe. This is an opinion that's not a fact. <laughs> but the poorly stitched bit is a fact, based on my own observation and opinion. Uh, that's the legal disclaimer. Mm. They attack Zara in Croatia, mm -hmm. not on uh, Burke Street or anywhere else. <laughs> and they use that money. They give that money to the Venetians. They give the city to the Venetians. Mm -hmm. And that's enough to get them to Constantinople. Mm. When they get to Constantinople, the Venetians ask for more money. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know what? We'll do it this way. Let's take over this city and then yeah. we'll divide it between us. Yeah. And that's what they did. They exploited the population that was supporting a grandfather and a grandson, mm -hmm. two factions. They took over the city. Most of them were already in the city at the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. And they sacked the city. Yeah. Nikitas Konyatis was a chronicler of the time. He says, I don't know where to begin, where to end, the things that they did, the outrages against the women, stripping uh, lead off roofs, stripping statues of, of their gold. He talks about a harlot, he used that word, being put on the patriarch's throne in the great church of St. Sophia, um, the altar being stripped of its silver, apparently it was a silver altar, and the whole place just given over to complete robbery. So... The city was divided mm. between the Venetians and all these other people that took part. And then the Byzantine Empire fragmented. So part of the ruling family went to Epirus and set up what was called the Despotate of Epirus. Part of the ruling family went to Nikia and they were considered the legitimate line of the Byzantines. Mm -hmm. And then part of them went to Pondos and started the Empire of Trapezunda. Yeah. And then these small remnants of the Greek Byzantine state started fighting between themselves, mm -hmm. until 60 years later, Michael Paleologos, who was uh, fighting the Bulgarians, is, happens to be in the neighbourhood of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. The Frankish king is not there because he's mm -hmm. fighting uh, somewhere else, and he just enters the city and takes over. So that's the recapture of Constantinople. But by that stage, yeah. this place is a shadow of itself. Yeah, Everything mm -hmm. of value, ancient artworks that mm -hmm. have been there since its founding, Mm. in the 300s AD mm. have vanished. Precious manuscripts have gone. 
all of the wealth of the city is gone. Mm. All of the architectural beauties are mostly mm. gone, looted, pillaged, pillaged, taken away f- as spoils of war. And if you want to get an understanding of what was taken, all you need to go do is go to Venice. As soon as you land in Piazza San Marco, mm. you will see in the corner of the Church of St. Mark mm. a porphyry statue of the four emperors. Wow. Okay, which were the original empor- emperors uh, during the time of the foundation of this of Constantinople, just before. Wow. Okay, you will find the four on top of the roof, the four horses, the four bronze horses from the Hippodrome. What you see now are copies. The original ones are in the museum, but right up until recently, the original ones from Constantinople, from the Hippodrome, because they were mad about horse races in Constantinople, are there. You go inside the great church. And you see the Paladoro, which is this massive gold altarpiece mm-hmm. with precious, started with precious stones and icons, and that's been stolen as well. There are chalices, that, you name it's there. Everything was taken away. Mm. Constantinople was a shadow of itself. Mm. It never recovered. Yeah. It was so weakened by all of this effort to defend itself, come back. Mm-hmm. Um, the Turks had exploited the power vacuum in the meantime. Yeah it was never able to fully recover. Mm. From the 1260s when Mikhail Paleologos comes back up until 1453, it's no longer a world player. Mm. It's a shadow of itself limping slowly and painfully to its grave. Apparently the city was, um, had a, by the time uh, Paleologos basically came in, it had a third of the population it did before the sacking. Yeah, because that's the other thing. They persecuted the Greeks, the Franks. They... Uh, demanded that they join the Catholic Church. Yeah. They persecuted the Orthodox Church. And this was one of the main sticking points. The main article of faith and identity for those people was their Orthodox faith. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That was something that they did. And obviously a lot of people fleed mm. to the free areas. Some people couldn't, yeah. but they were second-class citizens in their own homes. Mm. It was the first example of Western colonialization. Wow. Talking about imperialists. So, yeah, imperialists not allowed on this show Mm -hmm. because of 1204. (laughs) Understood, understood. So, uh, and as you said, uh, that, and from what I've read as well, that contributed significantly to to its fall in 1453. It was the major cause. The place was exhausted. Yeah. They couldn't come back. Yeah. So, uh, you also posted something about this guy here. This guy here. What does this guy look like to you? Revolutionary. He's got the long hair, yep. and most importantly, he's got the mustache. Mustache, the mustache. That's and right. And he's got what looks like a fustanella. I can't see that bit. Can but you read can. the inscription at the bottom? Tafel i butzi. Oh. Tafel Buzi. Buzi. I saw an so idea that actually wasn't when there. We, when we talk about freedom fighters, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's Kolokotroni, there's Garay Skaiki, there's uh, Athanasio Diaco, king of the Suvla, mm-hmm. there's uh, Odysseus Andruzos, who switched sides a couple of times, because that's what he did, depending on oh who was upsetting gee. you at the time. Mm. And we talk about how Phil Hellenes, Man Alexander Road, Mini Ponds. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, because his Iraq is just going to be a common feature of all our episodes. We're re-rikusing the re <laughs> What we're doing is this. Philolines, you have your Italians, you have your French, yep. some of them, you have your even English, Richard Church mm-hmm. uh, was one of them, great man. And uh, you even have your Serbs, you have some Bulgarians, you have mm-hmm. Russians mm-hmm. and other Western people who go there and have a bit of a look. Mm-hmm. But Albanians are generally considered to be on the other side. They yes. have the Turkalvani, you know, those harsh mm-hmm. people that took the side of the Turks and were their enforcers. Mm-hmm. Okay, and there's a lot of them. Omer Vrioni is one of them, who was at the siege of Mesolongi. Mm-hmm. He was an Albanian Muslim who fought for the Ottomans. And there were a lot of them. Mm. Tafel Buzi started off as a compatriot of Ali Pasha. He was born in Tepeleni, which is uh, in northern Epirus, which is now in Albania. Mm-hmm. And uh, he fought with Ali Pasha until the time that he was besieged by Khurshid Pasha. And yes, that is how that's pronounced, <laughs> Khurshid Pasha. <laughs> it's about to say. That's his name. Um, you can thank the Persians for that because Khurshid is a Persian name. Right. Yeah. Mm. 
So now, how am I supposed to finish the rest of this program? Straight <laughs> face? Can you tell yeah, me? How? I have no idea. <laughs> Say it with me, Khurshid Pasha. Khurshid Pasha. Beautiful. See, see that oh, one I knew how to pronounce. No, that's an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, Khurshid. Okay. <laughs> It's just it. such a catchy name. Isn't it? Who in their right mind <laughs> names their child Khurshid? <laughs> oh. Hey, Khurshid, you smell. <laughs> right. He, he besieges Ali Pasha in Yanena and eventually mm-hmm. kills Ali Pasha. Just before that happens, Tafil Buzi uh, sees which way the wind's blowing mm-hmm. and escapes. Right. And he goes down to the parts of Greece that are fomenting revolt and he says, mm-hmm. here I am. Uh, ready to fight. And we're like, cool. And he's a really, really good fighter. And he's a very valiant and brave man, like a lot of these Albanian captains were, because they're up in the mountains, very hardy people. Mm-hmm. They survived by brigandage, because mm. not much has grown up there. Mm. So he knew he was uh, how to fight, and he was a good warrior. Mm. He was such a good warrior that he was even sent by the Greeks to pacify regions where Greeks were fighting amongst themselves, mm-hmm. which happened never in the Greek Revolution. No, Greeks no. Were always no. united. Absolutely. And, you know, I campaigning would painting for the same cause. Thank you for giving me an excuse to use that word again. Which word was that? Absolutely. Indubitably, this is so, but the point <laughs> is this that he does this, and then even in Capolistria's time, he's sent to administer various parts of free Greece mm-hmm. until uh, Kondokotroni says, Well, you know what? They've asked us to all disband our bands. Mm-hmm. How come you still got the band? You know, if we can't have a band in the Battle of the Bands, neither will you. (laughs) So in order to preserve the integrity of the band, he disbands. Mm -hmm. And then he says, what am I going to do now? I've got nothing to do here in Greece. He's got a little bit of a pension. He goes back home to Tepele and he starts picking fights with the Ottomans again because obviously up there hasn't been liberated. Ipiros was not liberated during the 1820s. They had to wait till the 1913. Yeah, that's right. The Ottomans are getting sick of this guy who's fighting with the Himariotis and other Greeks up there yeah. trying to ferment revolt. And he escapes. Mm-hmm. And he goes to Egypt. Why would he go to Egypt? Because a lot of Albanians went to Egypt. The reason why they did was because Mehmet Ali, who was the, uh, if you like, the emir of Egypt, mm-hmm. originally came from Gavala. He was an Albanian from Kamala. Okay. His son Ibrahim, who landed in Peloponnesus and started killing all the Peloponnesians bec- and exploiting their differences, and his idea was he was going to kill and enslave all the Peloponnesians and replace them with Egyptians. Mm-hmm. Okay, that Ibrahim, that was his son. So Mehmet Ali takes over Egypt mm-hmm. as an officer yeah. who then carved out a semi-independent kingdom for himself. Okay. And the last member of that line was King Farouk in the 1950s. Right. Yeah. I had no so idea. of Albanian origin. Anyway. He goes down there, Piandik Ali, and he does what everyone else does. So, you know, but yeah, there's lots of gold here. Come. So all the Albanians start going there in search of jobs. That's why, if you have a look at the art from the period, yeah. there's all these paintings being done of people wearing the fustan there, in front of the pyramids, in the desert, because all these Albanians were a massive presence in Egypt in the 1800s. Wow. And the Albanians were the fustan and we were the fustan So it's really great. Like, sometimes I want to confuse people. I'll have a picture of some Albanians crossing the desert in the fustan and I'll say this is, uh, you know, Yiganis Kapetanakis crossing the Simpson Desert. Okay. <laughs> you know, with, with Charles Dirt or something. And, and people believe it because he's wearing a fustanella. How yeah. can you argue with that? It's actually yeah. Egypt. But yeah, so they're doing this. So he goes there in search of job and conditions. But mm. the Ottomans still have a price on his head. Mm-hmm. And they didn't have Interpol, but they had Turkopol. And the uh, <laughs> Turkopol is actually a word. Look it up. We'll talk about it next time. Okay. And he gets arrested and he gets killed right. by Ibrahim. He's. Uh, Killed on behalf of these Ottomans uh, who were after him. Right. But he was a great Greek freedom fighter. And there's a statue of him in his hometown of Tepeleni. That's that there. When you go to Tepeleni, as soon as you walk in, there's this massive bronze statue of Ali Pasha wearing a fustanella with his legs crossed lying on the couch. Ah, uh, yes. It's a really cool... Yeah, I haven't got that here. It's a I'm really afraid. cool statue. But uh, If I die, Pete, <laughs> and I leave enough money in my will, I want you to do this. I want you to commission a statue of me in polystyrene Polystyrene. Polystyrene. So it could be, so it could be carried around. So it could be carried around everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Just me reclining on a couch. A man of leisure. That's how I like to be remembered. Oh, gee. But that's what, that's, what, that's what you get as soon as you walk into Tepeleni. And then off to one side is the statue of Tafel Buzi, who we forget about, we don't honour, and perhaps we should. So they've got a statue of Tafel Buzi in northern Ipirus. No, because, yeah, well, northern Ipirus is in Albania, yeah? Yeah. 
Mm. So um, I find that I find that amazing that they want to still have a statue. No, because he's an, he's a national hero for the Albanians because he fought against the Ottomans. Oh, okay. Then. And the way they see it is, he's a precursor of their own independence. Right. Okay. Oh well, I suppose I suppose that makes sense. So you know how last week uh, we did our thing on on this day, and yeah. you know, so I, I, I tend to. Yeah. I can't remember last week. All yeah, the people, <laughs> well, just the blur. Yeah, probably a good probably a good thing. But one of the things that um, came up today, and I found a few a fair few things, but the one thing that came up today is the fifteenth of April. We're shooting this on the fifteenth of April. Okay, uh, is the sinking of the Titanic. Can you just edit that out when we're doing this show? Because I actually told my people that I was somewhere else on the 15th of April <laughs> and now I'm going to get into trouble because they'll watch this. Oh, uh, well, okay. So it's actually Thank really... Thank for stuffing that up. No, not a problem at all. It's actually the 15th of April. Oh, that makes it look <laughs> so much better, doesn't it? <laughs> That's a Pontian joke. Okay, so a fifteenth of April. I think we spoke about Pontian. Oh, we jokes. did. We did. Pontian it's jokes is a contradiction in terms. Pontians have no sense of humour. We have a great sense of, no humor. sense of humour. Great no sense of humour. Generally, Greeks don't have a sense of humour. <laughs> you're so wrong. I'm not wrong ever. <laughs> no, you're they wrong. lack. We they have lack a great irony. sense of humour. They lack irony, and Pontians in particular have no sense of humour. No, we that's don't. why they don't get any of the Pontian jokes. You tell a Pontian a Pontian joke. Okay. Mm. And they don't laugh. For example, I'll go up to a Kurd. And Kurds are a culturally distinct people. Mm. And they dance similar dances mm. to the Pondian. So it's the next best thing. Okay. And you say to a Kurd, for example, Yasu Kurda, Yasu. Pos pethane o telefteos kurdos. Yeah. 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 Okay, give me one, so, then I'm going to answer this. I have to answer okay, this. So, <laughs> Go on. There's a Pondian. Yeah. Okay. And he's uh, walking into a urinal. All right. Okay. And he's doing his business. Yeah. And another, and another guy uh, walks in. Yeah. And the Pondian looks up at him. What are you doing? And the guy says, the name's Bond, James Bond. Yeah. And the Pondian looks up and goes, my name is Pond, Rosso Pond. <laughs> See, nothing. And then there's the other one about the Pondian from the Ukraine. Yeah. Okay, and the one about the Pondian from Ukraine goes like this. Yeah. Same sort of uh, scenario. Mm. I don't know why all these Pondians always need to go to the toilet in my world. <laughs> it's in the urinal. Um, yeah. There's a guy already there doing his business. Yeah. The Pondian just turns to give him, you know, cursory glance, acknowledges his existence. Mm-hmm. The guy goes, name's Bill. Buffalo Bill. And mm. the Pondian goes to do his business and the Buffalo Bill looks down and notices something strange, uh, which is that uh, the appendage of the Pondian seems to be Siamese. There are two heads to it. Okay. And he looks at the Pondian in horror and the Pondian says, My name is Bill, Chernobyl. <laughs> oh, come on. Now, That's not a good joke. <laughs> now, you say this to a Kurd, he'll laugh his head off, especially if you tell him this in Greek. Yeah, you say this to a Pondian tipota, no sense of no, fear. no, no. The it, only it, person that has ever laughed in that at that joke, yeah. who's Pondian, is mm. Lefteris Pandazis. Okay, a very long time ago when I was in Greece, and he laughed at this joke, mm-hmm. and I think that was just to make me feel good because <laughs> I was young at the time. <laughs> Moving right along. Okay, listen, but you know, I've, I have to answer it though. No, you don't. <laughs> oh, you can't. There is no comeback. There is a there is a great comeback. I think that part of the reason why some people don't laugh at these jokes. Uh, is Possibly because they're offensive and stereotypical? Yeah. See, that's what you would say. You failed, to, <laughs> you failed to see the light side. Come on. You know what? Next thing you tell me, you're triggered by racist jokes. <laughs> I don't mind them at all, but I know many Pondians that don't, who really don't care about it. I don't at know all. any Pondians. No, no, no. No, probably, probably not. No. So. Nick, we've actually on, gone on a huge tangent, but let me just fire this back up again. Okay, so. Titanic sank. Apparently four Greeks on the uh, Titanic, I found out. So we always got to link something back to Greece. Yes. And of course... Must. Titanicos, Titanic. Yes. The Titans were these... The gods before the gods. Yes. And this is the lovely thing about Greeks. You mm. always have to overthrow someone to 
grain purchase into the social order. We're taking it to that, are we? No, but that's true. You have uh, Gaia and Uranus. Yeah, yes. Not yours in particular, <laughs> yeah, okay. but a generic Uranus. <laughs> okay. And then Kronos, Time, who was a Titan. Yes. Uh, is egged on by his mother mm-hmm. to Gaia. chop off his father's testicles. Mm-hmm. Okay. And to assume the reins of power. Yes. Now, that's something deeply psychological there that has to do with the relationship of the Greek mother with their child Mm. and with emasculation. How that works, I'm not going to go into because I'm not qualified. (laughs) I'll just leave that there for thought. (laughs) But the Titans ruled the world. Mm. And then Zeus came along and his mother told him, dude, Kronos is eating all of your, all of my children, mm-hmm. and you're the last one. Mm. So what do we do about this? They go and hide him in a cave, and they mm-hmm. put a lozenge, mm-hmm. a stone lozenge, mm-hmm. in Kronos's mouth. He regurgitates all the kids. Uh, Zeus comes out, either kills or imprisons his father, depending on whether you're watching the Disney version <laughs> of the, the cartoon, yeah, and uh, assumes control of the gods. Right. But even Zeus is uneasy because there's a prophecy that should he ever have a son through. The, uh, Thetis, she will become, he will become stronger than the father, which is why he marries Thetis off to a mortal, and Achilles is the result. But he's constantly worried about a prophecy where his son will be greater than him. Mm-hmm. And who knows if the ancients had existed and were able to create further myths, what mm. would have happened? But there's always that fear of, you know. But the Titans were the gods before the gods. You know, in uh, Game of Thrones, you have the old gods and the new. No, I don't. They were the old gods. Right. Okay. Mm. You could have just said yes to make me feel like <laughs> <different laughs> I'm, I'm just being flow, honest. Here. <laughs> honesty is irrelevant. Flow is everything. Yeah, and you disrupted right. the flow. Absolutely. This is more of an eddy mm. than a flow. <laughs> we're and just ebbing along, are we? Absolutely. Now, <laughs> so Titanic, something which is vast, mm. you know, something which is big, something which is primordial, which is almost supernatural, mm. like this massive ship here. Yeah. The Titanic, bearing four Greeks. Do you know what their names were? Not off the top of my head, no. I think I've written, I thought I'd have written them down somewhere. No, one of them. I know they were all from uh, Messinia. The Roca la <laughs> They were all from some Jorio called Ayos Sotiris. Well, Sotiris. the thing about Calamatiani, yeah. especially here in Melbourne, is they like to commemorate everything. Yes. They like to commemorate the Battle of Calamata. Yes. They like to commemorate Papa Flesa. Yes, Kalamata and Olives. Um, the, <laughs> that battle. What, what, what was that battle in World War Two? Where some, you know, uh, m- maybe one Australian and his dog possibly fought with the, uh, with the uh, British there, and they evacuated the town. So the Messenians make much of that. I uh, no, don't know it. They commemorate everything. Yeah, battle. Of, they'll, they'll pillage me. Uh, they'll they'll <laughs> they'll pillory me for this because I should know this, and I don't know this because I can't remember because I'm not from Kalamata. However, mm. my brother-in-law is from Kalamata. Oh, he is, and he is the most righteous and harmonious human being I've ever known. Oh, well, that's uh, that. that well, that in the end, that's what counts. Absolutely. Mm. So, there were Kalamatiani, you say? There were there, there were three of them uh, drowned. One of them actually made it to a, a boat, apparently, but the boat was uh, lost. So they assumed that they all starved to death. Never found. A tragic story. Uh, one of those enduring. Uh, historical events that even today haunt us, even though it happened but my concern, so long ago. Yeah, I know, and um, it might be a uh, uh, you know a very a big downer to end the show on. But my question was, and my question is, why weren't they actually shown on the film? The Greeks, yeah. Like I'm thinking about James Cameron had a three hours of you know all glorifying the Titanic. I did not see one, remember seeing one scene with these Greeks on the, there were the film. Some other ethnics in steerage class weren't there that they they showed them there that there was some I think they were poles or something like that going to New World. Yeah, I, but I, or am I am I confusing that with another film because I fell asleep during the movie? <laughs> oh, you fell asleep! You fell asleep during I the film. I found this music <laughs> this movie so boring and you so irrelevant. <laughs> I struggled to stay awake, and I finally. We succumbed. fell asleep too. Yeah, uh, it was it, it was a mistake we made. We thought we'd go Sorry, watching Golden. In plural, I'll just hasten to say that I did not fall asleep <laughs> <with this man laughs> during the movie. I fell asleep separately on a separate occasion. It was not the fifteenth of April. I was not with him at the time. With me. With me. So um, uh, I remember I uh, made the mistake of uh, booking a gold class seat, and we had reclined the chairs, and we fell asleep while watching it. So I don't remember much of the film, to be honest. I don't believe in gold class because I believe in the classless society. <laughs> it's part of my Bolshevik roots. 
and I went there because I was told to, mm. and I fell asleep. Mm. And I woke up during the bit where he's saying, I'm the king of the world. Oh, you woke up during that bit. And oh, you didn't miss the And I, the I money say, shot. I said to myself, well, this is wrong because I am a Republican. And we can't have this. <laughs> you can't have a world. king of the world, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's A. B, and most importantly, yeah, that final, towards the end, they're in the water. Yeah. And what's that woman's name? Kate, Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet. Yeah. No, Leonardo... Sell me this pen, Caprio. Yeah. Gets off, gentleman, allows her to get on the crate. Mm -hmm. And Leonardo freezes to death he because does. it's icy water. Mm -hmm. And that horrible, selfish, mm. self centered mm. person has not got the decency to say, you know what, Leo, sell me this pen, Wolf of Wall Street, Caprio. Caprio? <laughs> How about we take it in turns? 15 minutes me in the water, mm. and then 15 minutes you in the water. And that way, mm. maybe we'll both survive. Mm. Or maybe, yeah. maybe if he was one of those brothers. Or because I love you so much and you steam up somebody else's car windows. <laughs> yeah. And I would have preferred in that scene, see, if I was directing this movie, yes. I would have gotten her to write on the window, wash me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can infer from that whatever you want. <laughs> is it the car that's dirty? Is it their consciousness that are dirty? Mm. The world is your symbolic oyster. Yes. You can turn it into from a Hollywood blockbuster into a film noir. Oh, and wow. the best way to do that is by just turning the bloody thing off. <laughs> that should get she you. They him. should get you to start to start writing spoofs for films. I think. I think you'll. I think you'll be masterful see, at it. See, this is something which hurts me very deeply. <laughs> you don't take what I say seriously. Oh yeah, of course not. Not only do you do that, but you allow this mm. unserious approach to what I have to say to be filmed <laughs> and then exposed to the rest of the populace. And if this is the way you're going to conduct yourself during my show, mm. I would rather interview myself if that's okay. Well, we could always arrange for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What we'd have to do, what we'd have to do is we'd get a cardboard cut out of me to put where you are. Yeah. And I could just talk to myself and berate myself. Or we can just shoot you twice. One when you're on that side and one when you're this side and we just splice them together as if you're interviewing yourself. Now that is an idea. Me, me, and I don't talk. <laughs> yeah, well, We've been this. I don't know how the two of you get along. We have, we have creative differences. Yeah, um, we've been to counselling. It's yeah. best if we're apart. Okay, all right. Now, um, we've got uh, uh, an issue. Um, uh, we still have no outro. I know it's a recurring theme on this show, but see, the problem with the outro is this: we had. A, I thought we we had a really good outro last week by Miyagno Katerina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I got flagged by the nincompoops who said, "Oh, you know, if you ever make money, as if we're going to make money, <laughs> yeah, yeah, show, yeah, as if we are, we 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 want profits because you know, seriously." <laughs> and I conceive of saying goodbye in different ways. Obviously, we can't use the uh, so long farewell from the sound of music because Julie Andrews will be knocking on our door. Christopher Plummer's dead, so that's okay. <laughs> but I've heard she's vicious. I haven't heard anything, but I'll take your word for it. She's she's a vicious, vicious lady mm. when it comes to these things, policing mm. uh, irrelevant podcasts. <laughs> and I love Stratos Dionysio. Oh, two okay. Reasons. Stratos Dionysio has the longest earlobes in Greek music. Mm -hmm. They're massive. Okay. Yeah, you should watch sometime. <laughs> oh, I will after this show. Singer, and he had this song... Εγώ που ήμουν αθεός θα φύγω τώρα σαν τρελός yeah. θα φύγω σαν κυνηγημένος right. because he's a lover he used to be her god and now yeah. she's rejected him just like you know um, Kronos cut the genitals of uh, his father Uranus and he stopped being a god mm -hmm. okay it's kind of the same thing Εγώ που ήμουν αθεός θα φύγω τώρα σαν τρελός αποκλήρος although in order to get the music right he says αποκλήρος and uh, puts the emphasis on the wrong syllable right Apokliros. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you can do that in music, yeah, though, can't you? Yeah, mm. and bitter. Mm. So I thought, could we do this? Yeah. And then you said, no, we can't, because then we'll have his sons knocking on our door. <laughs> and <laughs> Angelo's <laughs> been here. He was at Kinesi for a long time, singing here during the crisis, you know, earning a crust, honest toil, yeah. and did a very good job. Mm. And he's a good singer. Both the boys, Angelos and Stegos, they have tones which remind you of their father. Mm -hmm. They're good singers in their own right, but they mm -hmm. have that thing which you can see a lineage Mm. Of of song, there. okay, and uh, so we can't sing that song. So no, I I'll play it as the outro. Okay, but we could this, do that with this caveat, you know, budgerigars. Yeah, they can either talk 
or they can fly. Mm -hmm. But they can't do both because their brain is too small. <laughs> I, musically, I'm the same way. Okay. Being a violinist by trade, mm. I can't sing and play because I never had to. Mm -hmm. So I won't sing. You'll, but you'll play. I'll play. Do you want to sing? I'm not singing. I don't know the words of the song. I should have written them down. Should I told have. you. Yeah. How Greek is that? I, who was once a god. Of course you were. You were a Greek god. <laughs> what do you think you were? And then that passive aggressive, oh, you hurt me. I'm going to leave like a crazy man. <laughs> As if there is any other type. Yeah? Yeah. Persecution complex. Yes. Yeah. You can't get more Greek. No, you that. can't. So with my Chinese instrument. All right. And hoping that I remember the notes because I've just forgotten everything. trelos. <laughs> And then does that bit where he loses his voice and goes, Eroxenos, <laughs> That's a great outro. I don't think we'll repeat this experience. No, probably not. Uh, <laughs> well, until uh, until next time. How's about that? Share it, Diaz. <laughs> See you later. And then does that bit where he loses his voice and goes, Eroxenos, <laughs> Eroxenos. <laughs>